Since late 1998, the Kentucky Oral History Commission, a division of the Kentucky Historical Society, has collected over 175 stories about the civil rights movement in Kentucky. These are stories of people who made a difference, who had the courage and commitment to act for social justice. Learn more on the Internet at www.ket.org slash civil rights. They would uh, hang colored men. There would be a mob of people that would ride around and some screaming about burning down this entire community for no other reason than we wanted to attend school. And if you wanted something to eat in the restaurant, you went in the back door of the restaurant. We decided that an awful lot of money was spent by us downtown not to have any salespeople. My mother told me, it's going to come a time when you've got to, they're going to arrest you. And we were going to take over the whole student center. When I just can't believe that we started such a movement. My mother and father were slaves. My daddy was brought from West India and my mother was from Virginia. They brought her here on a mule and they were on the covered wagon and she rode a mule. He was born free, but they had a man to, of some outfit that went around and, and brought him and brought him here to sell. Well, my roots go back to uh, my great-grandmother, who was a slave. Her name was Jane Arthur. She was born in 1828. She's owned by the Arthur family in Knox County. And when the daughter of the Arthur family married a minister named Preston Bond, Jane was given to the daughter as a wedding present. <laughs> What I know is black skin could get you whipped and worked like the strongest mule. But I had only two legs to stand on, one for stripping tobacco in the hot August sun, the other to balance myself against the misunderstanding that I, too, was a cash crop, harvested in my mother's womb to be picked and sold to the highest bidder. My father fought in the Civil War. He, he, he wanted to be free. He went to Paducah to join the army before this fighting for freedom. See, if it hadn't been for them, we'd still be slaves. The 13th Amendment ended slavery at the close of the Civil War. However, African Americans in Kentucky and throughout the nation were not allowed to live freely. Jim Crow laws forced blacks and whites to live in separate societies. Whites often terrorized the African American communities. Black people lived under a continual threat of lynchings and mob violence. We, we were scared to death all the time because they called them night riders. We lived between here and Baltimore where they so slave. And on third Monday, they get drunk and they, you hear them up the road, hee hoo, hee hoo. And if we can do something to you and the house up from us is shot through there, then they come on down. And uh, they said to my father, said, oh, nigga West, come out here. And he said, just a minute. And he told my mother, her, my mother named Fanny, said, Fanny, hit the floor and get the children. And he told them to come in, and they didn't. And my mother was on her knees praying that they wouldn't come in because she knew that they would kill all of us. 
I don't know why they hated it so. The work of the Ku Klux Klan in Kentucky and many places, uh, they have been and I fear continue to be quite active. During the 60s, yes, they were active. Uh, places like over in uh, Darrowville, uh, over in Allen County, um, around Russellville, there where you would hear of meetings of these groups. At that time, it was uh, somewhat frightening. Uh, you weren't quite sure what might happen uh, in a rural community. Uh, and the sad truth is there were no black people on the police department. Uh, uh, many of the people in law enforcement may have been just as supportive of the Klan as uh, anyone else. Uh, downtown Lexington was a vibrant um, center, uh, a very traditional kind of place. Uh, if one was a proper person, one did not go downtown without hat and gloves, preferably white gloves. Stewart's uh, was there as a general store, and of course Wolf Wiles, but there were also what I call five-a-dime stores, variety stores, and these were uh, places that also had uh, lunch counters where you could come and sit and have a quick lunch while you were shopping downtown at noon time, for example. Except that these lunch counters were not available uh, to um, African Americans to sit. You could not even go downtown to shop and go in the restroom, use the restroom. And you couldn't eat unless you were walking down the street eating a sandwich which was so rude and so crude to have to walk down the street to eat. And uh, you just felt humiliated when you walked in the store to buy a sandwich, knowing that you could not sit down and everybody else was sitting down. So it was uh, very humiliating. When you were raised up in a segregated society, you learned to coexist with the pressures that are around you. The, uh, the pressures, uh, sometimes including understanding when you go in the white department store what the limitations are. We would lose our hat business. The hat bar is in full public view. I don't believe your wife would try on hats she'd just seen Negro women taking off their greasy hair, regardless of how she may feel about integration. You could shop in all stores, but you could not try on clothes. So therefore, if I shopped at Rhodes or Martins in those days, I couldn't try on a pair of shoes. Uh, but if you wanted something to eat in a restaurant, you went in the back door of the restaurant. Things you don't even think about with pride today, you would never do star before I go in the back door of a restaurant. Well, the movie houses uh, were not available except ones which had separate balconies entered from the back uh, for those uh, who were African American. After I'd been elected in 1968, sworn in, state senator, first African American, and I went to get a room in a hotel to stay and could not get a room. You were allowed to go uh, into the stores and, and, and buy without too much difficulty. You just weren't allowed to work in them except as maids and elevator operators and custodians. When I left my school, I could really could actually do it uh, 80 words a minute. And uh, in shorthand was probably about 100 words a minute. So when I got my credentials, I was fully qualified for the, to do the job. But where the frustration set in at was that after you started to look for employment, you couldn't get it. And you couldn't get in there to find out a reason why that you couldn't get it because nobody was going to tell you why. 
during the Christmas season, if you were black and you came into the store and you wanted to buy something, I could sell you something, but I couldn't take your money. The white man had to work the cash register of a white woman. But if I wanted a job doing anything other than cleaning the building and stocking the product and putting the mannequin together, I had to move away where I could find a better opportunity for employment. And, and I found myself being in the same boat. I had to leave town. It made you feel less than a human being. It was a custom that we became used to in order to survive. Or at least our parents became used to it. And I think that's one of the things that we rejected was, okay, you took it. Now is the time that we might be able to break the barriers down. My two feet stride into a hundred thundering footsteps, marching to an uncommon rhythm of peace, a cadence of justice, equality, and all that is right. My one voice echoes into a chorus, a resounding chant, repeating freedom's sweet harmonies of heaven-bound folk with hell-bent conviction. If not now, when? If not me, who? People make a movement. While there had been resistance in Kentucky since the Civil War, individuals and organizations statewide stepped up action during the Civil Rights era. The National Civil Rights Movement with Rosa Parks, the Montgomery Boycott, and the Greensboro sit-ins provided examples of courage and action outside Kentucky. I got involved in the Civil Rights Movement when a fellow student at Morehouse College in Atlanta showed me a newspaper story that talked about the sit-ins in Greensboro, which had begun on February 1st, 1960. And the story just described how these college students in Greensboro had gone into the Woolworths department store, had sat at the lunch counters, how they dressed, how they acted, how they behaved. It's like a blueprint how to sit in. And he said, don't you, what do you think about this? I said, hey, that's great. He said, don't you think it ought to happen here? And I said, oh, I know it's gonna happen here. Somebody's gonna do that here. And he said, why don't we make it happen here? And faced with that challenge, I had to respond, yes, I'll help make it happen here. Because I had the feeling, and I think we commonly had the feeling, that here was a problem, it needed to be solved, here was a solution laid out for us, and if we didn't do it, then who would? It wouldn't be done. Nobody was doing anything to make, make any changes. And, uh, and we knew that if we got involved in this, that we would need to have numbers. And we did not really have that many people who really belonged to the NAACP. Uh, a lot pay dues, uh, but they didn't attend mean, meetings and, and things. And, and I could understand it because we weren't doing anything. And, and again, it goes back to our belief that things were different, but not as bad as other places and that we had more or less lived this way all this long and had gotten along, you know, okay. And so why bother with the change? It was 1961 and I was right outside of Quinn Chapel and I could hear the singing inside as they prepared to go and march downtown. And it occurred to me that I couldn't be in a school situation teaching kids that this was the greatest country in the world when they couldn't even go downtown to try on clothes or have a hot dog or, or buy a sandwich in a downtown restaurant. And so I went in because I had to participate in changing that in order to let those students know that there was a way that you can change things. And so I went in and got involved immediately. Congress of Racial Equality, Equality was becoming a reality here in, in Lexington. And uh, Julia Lewis, who was uh, elected president of that group, and I were friends, and because she also belonged to uh, the NAACP, and I, in turn, joined 
core so we kind of work together. Well, I was raised up in a little community called Franklin, Kentucky, on the Kentucky-Tennessee line, south-central Kentucky. Uh, I had worked in the student council in my high school, and it was in the student council work that I kind of began to understand parliamentary procedure and how to work with organizing groups and what committees ought to do and how to do research and how to present position papers, if you will. Uh, but it was taking that little bit of training I gained in high school, uh, to be honest with you, and uh, translating that into the work of the NAACP. I was involved in active in the NAACP at 17, and when I got out of high school, became more and more active in it. Um, um, I had dual teaching certificate, elementary and special ed, so I taught in special education class out at uh, uh, the old Douglas School. Then that summer I worked for the Community Action Agency and um, the, the Urban League director had come here to open the agency and he had um, had a temporary quarters at the YMCA where I was living my last semester. I, we became friends so that fall after I had worked for Community Action I was going to go back to teaching Fair County Schools and he asked me to come to work for the, for the Urban League and so I'm right out of college about 21, 22 years of age. And um, I became uh, executive director of the Urban League, and, and at that time I was the youngest director uh, in the nation. It's the young people who begin to uh, test their ideals 13, 14, 15 years of age, and they need to have some opportunities um, to try these out, and this was certainly one of those opportunities. Individuals were the force behind the movement in Kentucky. Men, women, and young people took a stand single-handedly or locked arms with various organizations throughout the state to fight for freedom. Well, with a lot of the black people did, they did like a lot of the maintenance type of jobs blue-collar employment. Uh, they worked in people's homes and they would just be really housekeepers and cooks. And uh, so, and that was one of the reasons why our parents would encourage us to get an education. The struggle for equal education has always been an uphill battle. In 1904, Kentucky's day law said public and private schools must be segregated. African American leaders at first targeted colleges and universities for desegregation. In 1949, Lyman Johnson, a Louisville High School teacher and NAACP activist, successfully sued for admission to the University of Kentucky. But historically, school boards across the state gave little support to schools attended by black students. We were fortunate enough that during those days, your smartest, uh, best educated people were teachers. The majority of the black teachers were very good. They had come up with those old ones who had told you to do the very best that you can and, and prepare and have those students ready for life when, it, when the change came. I had attended Dunbar School, which was an elementary, um, junior high and high school situation. Those days were good, but those were days of being with other students in my peer group. And it was a segregated community and it was a segregated school. We knew that we had over the years got hand-me-down books. We even got the football uniforms that the white kids, when they wore them out, they would pass them to the black schools. The books that were worn out came to the black schools. Um, the hand-me-down equipment, everybody knew it would be better if we could integrate the schools. Not that we necessarily wanted to be beside white people, but the feeling was that the resources would be shared equally with black students as well. On August 31st, 1956, 
eight black students enrolled at the previously all-white Sturgis High School. In Sturgis and Clay, small rural western Kentucky towns, more than 200 members of the National Guard and state police were called to break up disturbances by hostile whites. I was 13, and uh, there was a crowd of people there that had all shovels, pick forks, uh, that were outside of the school, uh, uh, name calling, and uh, uh, and it began to increase. There were threats about that uh, uh, you niggas won't live to see another day if you come back to school here. Uh, uh, any niggas that have any uh, have any kids out here won't have a job if you continue to go. So there was a great deal of anger and also a great deal of fear that for no other reason that we were going to school that there would be a mob of people that would ride around with a thought and some screaming about burning down this entire community for no other reason that we wanted to attend school. <laughs> the day that we walked into the building was a real shock because nobody expected it. There was no advance notice of this. There were students that had no idea that they were walking into this situation, an integrated situation. And that's when the whole sequence of events began. Uh, Dorothy was my best high school friend. And we walked to school every day together. And one morning, we walked on 7th Street to approach our building, our high school, and we saw police cars and state trooper cars. And our comments to each other were, <laughs> well, wonder what's gonna happen today, because we had come to, I guess, anticipate almost anything on any given day. We rounded the corner, and in front of us we saw the majority of the students on either side of this walkway. And on that particular day, the students had decided that they were not going to attend classes with us, that they no longer wanted to go to school with us. But there were students on either side of the walkway yelling uh, all the things that was yelled, nigga, coon, we don't want to go to school with you, go home, uh, we're tired of this, we're sick of looking at you, you're terrible person, get away from us, you're dirty, you stink. So I said, well, what are we going to do? I think they were probably angry people anyway and just didn't understand. They didn't understand who we were, nor did they really want to find out. We were that first generation that went through segregated schools. Although mail was integrated, it was still very much segregated. We had our section of the cafeteria, they had theirs. It was not a good experience in terms of education. But it was a great experience in terms of teaching you how to deal with society. Um, being on campus during the time was, was sometimes kind of, kind of intimidating from the standpoint of, I mean, you, you got used to racial slurs. Uh, you're walking past the fraternity houses, you would hear the N-word quite a bit coming from, from, from the guys up in there. Um, sometimes, there, there were times when they would, they would kind of sick the dog, because fraternity houses, they have what, mascots, dogs, and so forth, sometimes they would kind of let those dogs loose to do it, but it was, uh, it, 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 it did not deter me, you know, because I was convinced that I was going to graduate, because I was the first person uh, in my family to have an opportunity to go to college, and, and uh, you know, and uh, I just, I, I, I owed that to my, to my mother, my father, my sisters, and brothers. Ken, Tucky, beautiful, ugly cousin, I too am of these hills. My folks have cornrowed tobacco, laid track, strip mined, worshipped and whiskeyed from Harlan to Maysville, Old Dunbar to Central. 
Our Whitney Youngs and May Street kids cut their teeth on bourbon balls. And though conspicuously absent from millionaire's role, we have Isaac Murphy our way down the back stretch. Cash has clayed our names in cement. We are the amen in church, hill, downs, the mint in the julep. We put the heat in the hot brown and gave it color. Indeed, some of the bluegrass is black. Demonstrations to open up segregated facilities took place in many communities across the state. Kentucky chapters of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, known as SCLC, all led protests. The idea of keeping whites and African Americans apart was reinforced in all areas of public life. Signs that read, white only, or colored only, kept you in your place. Unwritten rules of mistreatment were enforced by white owners and employees in public facilities. You know, we focused in sometimes on just one or two or three restaurants that put forth the biggest resistance. Um, the Blue Boar was one of those restaurants. It was located at 4th and um, what is now Muhammad Ali. That was very popular. The owner of that restaurant was the president of the Louisville Restaurant Association. The strategy was if you got him to open up, then most of the other members of that organization would. And it wasn't a new thing because earlier demonstrations had been started by another group of young people a few years earlier who had tried to see um, Porky and Bess downtown. And that was basically led by the NAACP youth group. And it was right 1959, when I was a junior, that we picketed at the Brown Theater on Christmas Day, the opening of Porky and Bess, which was my first uh, involvement in direct action. You know, we, we really looked up to the, the students, especially the older students who were involved, not so much the, the adults. But that was right around the time that, that young African American students and young white American students were beginning to get involved in the movement. And of course, that's really what turned the tide, historically. Uh, and nothing new for Easter campaign in Louisville was kind of our local expression of that. Easter was coming up. CORE, the NAACP, adult chapters got together with the youth and we decided we would try an economic boycott. And our slogan became, nothing new for Easter. As we began to grow, we then could take on the movie theaters and Blue Boar. And by the third week of demonstration, we could take on the entire downtown area where we could close it. And that was our after-school activity. When we met at the churches before we went out to do the walking, we went over and over with what was expected. And more often than not, you told people if they could not adhere to that focus, please don't march. Stay here and be supportive of us. And we certainly had uh, training, lots of training sessions here. Training involved setting up a mock situation in which various people played the part of uh, the, in the case of a lunch counter, the servers, the manager, the uh, people coming in to be served, some of the other people who were sitting at the counter and so forth. Mentally, you had to prepare yourself or we didn't want you marching if you weren't able to take this. If you're ready to go to war with these folks, we didn't want you marching because it would interrupt. We, at the time, were operating on the King's philosophy of nonviolence. Every day before we would demonstrate, we would raise our hand and take a pledge that we would be nonviolent as we were demonstrating. No matter if rocks were thrown, eggs, if we were spat upon or arrested, we would remain committed to the philosophy 
that we would not physically retaliate. I remember one afternoon, a guy spat on me. I wanted to grab him so bad. But I had taken the pledge, and I couldn't. When we began to do the lunch counter, the one advantage we had was the core members. And, and as I said, they had a number of white members within that group. One Saturday when uh, we had a major demonstration at H.L. Green and I, at the lunch counter to demand uh, service and had both um, black and white potential patrons in the line waiting to be served, um, the manager had um, chained off the area around the lunch counter and stood as the guard to determine who would be allowed into the lunch counter area and who would not. It was my time to be in the front of the line and he had this little chain and he just kept swinging the chain and it kept hitting me in the front of the leg. Um, and she stood her ground and the result was that the chain um, actually whipped against her legs and did permanent damage uh, to her uh, legs between the knee and the ankle. And I was looking at him and all I wanted to do was to take that chain and wrap it around his neck. And so I had to start singing, Yield Not to Temptation. Where all the verses came from, I will never know. And I'm sure I made up some verses. But I sang it over and over until we all started singing it, you know, uh, while we were standing there. We sang songs because the civil rights songs tend to soothe you. They tend to make you feel like you weren't by yourself and isolated, okay? So if they arrested you and everybody is still singing, you know, we shall overcome or we shall not be moved, when you got there, you felt some, some strength. When we focused on Fountain Ferry, which was an amusement park in Western Louisville that was for whites only, and that was extremely dangerous. That was probably the most dangerous time in the Louisville movement because we had to go into a neighborhood and uh, they pelted us with rocks and Coke bottles and everything else, and that was a pretty rough one. We decided that an awful lot of money was spent by us downtown not to have any salespeople there. And so the two groups in our meetings uh, decided that we were going to demand that uh, blacks be hired as sales people uh, in, the, in the various stores. I think the first time that we went down and this was, was done and we all met back at, uh, at Pleasant Green Church and I mean, we were real upset. I mean, it took a whole lot of uh, talking and, and Reverend Jones, a whole lot of praying to kind of get us in the right, you know, frame, frame of mind because it was the first experience of that sort of thing and it wasn't pleasant at all. There was one restaurant that would take it a little step further. They would mop their floor and have the dirty mop water waiting on us when we arrived. And they would throw that on us. Now, that was kind of difficult for most of us to take. But we all did. Uh, no one, after having taken the pledge, wanted to be the one that broke it. And it almost became like a badge of courage to us. We could take the rest. We could take whatever the opposition handed out. In 1964, 10,000 people from across the state marched in Frankfurt demanding civil rights legislation. Um, that particular day, I was very cold, and we picked Dr. King up here at the airport and and transported him to Frankfurt. When we got there, it was just uh, just a big crowd. They said there were more than 10,000 people, and I'm sure there were. 
But Dr. King spoke, Dr. Jackie Robinson spoke, Peter, Paul, and Mary were there uh, singing folk songs. After the uh, speeches were over, Dr. King and Jackie Robinson talked to the governor, and the governor was very polite. He didn't come out to meet the people, but he was very polite, and he smiled, and he was saying he was going to do what he could, and, and he was going to try to get the legislature to vote for it. However, the bill was defeated. But in two years' time, it gave us time to regroup, to go out into the community and build up support all over the state uh, with legislators so that when it came back in 1966, we were stronger and we had more support for it, and it did pass in 1966. The failure of the 1964 Act was controversial. Governor Breathitt, who had worked with President Johnson in the passage of the Federal Civil Rights Act, along with grassroots leaders, continued to build support, and in 1966, the bill passed. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described it as the strongest and most comprehensive civil rights bill passed by a southern state. The right to choose the area of the city in which they wanted to live was a right that was denied Kentucky black families for many years. Black people were often forced to live in substandard housing. It was in March, as I recall, I believe it was March of 1954, um, a young man named Andrew Wade, who was, is African American, came and asked us to buy a house in Shively uh, and transfer it to him because he wanted to move his family out of the west end of Louisville and the suburbs were growing up around cities everywhere and that was true in Louisville. But African Americans couldn't buy in those places because there had been what was called restrictive covenants and written into deeds that whites couldn't sell, you couldn't sell property to anybody who wasn't white. Those had been ruled illegal by the Supreme Court, but there was an unwritten law. The banks wouldn't lend you money. The real estate people wouldn't show you the houses. Um, you just couldn't do it. Um, but he tried anyway. He was, um, he was young. He had fought for freedom in World War II. He'd been active in things. He felt he could stand up for his rights, and he felt he had a right to live out there if he wanted to. But we just said, sure, and it would have been unthinkable to us to say no, because this is something we believe in. Either you live by what you believe in or you don't. They some way, Roan, who owned the house, found out he was moving in. Then Roan came up and said, um, are, you, um, are you doing some work here for the Bradens? And Andrew said, no, said, I'm moving in. And then Roan was, he said, you're doing what? You're moving in? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I bought the house. Well, all hell broke loose right away. They went back to the house on Saturday. The, the picture went in the front. It had been broken by rocks. I think that happened while they weren't there. And then that night, they heard gunshots, and somebody was firing at the house. And Andrew said he told his wife to get down and so forth, but it didn't hit anybody. And they looked out, and there was a cross burning in the field next to him. So he called the police, and he called us and told us and the main paper in town came out with an editorial about what a terrible thing this was that we had done and blamed us. It was understandable why Wade would want a house, but why would we do such a thing to make it possible? And it was late Saturday night. My husband worked at night, and it was um, after midnight, I think. The phone rang, the phone rang a lot at nights, but I picked it up and it was Andrew. And he was very calm. He said, we're all right, but they just blew the house up. So the house had been dynamite set under it. On one side of the house, blew all that side of the house to pieces. Nobody was hurt. And Rosemary, their little girl, three-year-old little girl, or almost three, um, was not there. We never knew whether the people who put the dynamite under the house knew whether she was there or not because the dynamite was set right under her bedroom. Well, the open housing effort was in Louisville, Kentucky. And the mayor of Louisville at that time opposed it. He, he really reflected the views of the real estate lobby and interests in Louisville, the property owners. And it was not uh, moving ahead. Uh, 
Reverend King helped sponsor a effort to stop the derby by having a group of young people sit on the track uh, uh, and have a sit-down strike right on the track. As a result of the stubbornness of the city administration, the short-sightedness of many persons in the power structure, and the blatant abuses and indignities that Negroes face as a result of segregated housing in Louisville, it was announced some time ago that the freedom movement had no alternative but to engage in direct action around the world-famous Kentucky Derby. This really concerned me. I told him I would do everything I could. I'd have National Guardsmen without weapons, carefully trained, to protect his young people. Well, of course, it became a great issue right up until the time of the Derby and got all kinds of publicity. And Dr. King called me at 11 o'clock that morning. I was having a breakfast for a number of people over at the governor's mansion before the Derby. And he called and said, I've thought about it, Governor. We're not going to have them there. And I said, Dr. King, my prayers have been <laughs> answered. Well, we are hoping that uh, people of goodwill will rise up, as I said, and demand that the city do something to comply with our just demands. The mayor knows that as long as this problem is not solved, there's going to be tension in the community. In 1966 and 67, the communities of Barstown, Covington, Lexington, and Louisville passed Kentucky's first local housing ordinances. Uh, one of the first bills I introduced in the Senate was open housing bill. And my seatmate said to me, you never passed that. I said, well, watch me. I just got there. I don't even know the ropes yet. Don't even know how to draft a bill. It so happens that bill went into his, the committee that he chaired, Judiciary Committee. And every time I'd ask him, Tom, when are you going to get my bill out of your committee? He'd say, every time I bring it up, I lose a quorum. The most important bill to most of those men in that session was daylight saving time. That's all they were concerned about. The ones in the rural areas talked about how the cows wouldn't give the right milk and the right amount because changing the time. And when they came to me and asked me what I thought about time, I said, I'm not concerned about time. I'm concerned about open housing, prohibiting discrimination in selling and leasing property that people should be able to buy where they can afford. Well, when uh, my seatmate found that the op he was for it, for Daylight Savings Time, when he found that the opposition had 19 votes opposed to Daylight Savings Time, that's one half the Senate. He had 18 votes, but he didn't have nine. Now, I tell young people that one vote is so important. That one vote. So he came to me and he said, if I get your bill out of the committee, will you vote with us? I said, I don't know. You have to get it out with the expression that it should pass because that would give impetus to the bill once it gets to the floor. So the very next morning, he met me at the Capitol door and he said, I got your bill out of the committee. I said, oh, great, Tom. I said, let's check it at the Senate office, Senate clerk's office, and we did. They had, reported it out with the expression that it should pass. Now you gonna vote with me? I said, not yet. What's the matter? I said, you take this roll call sheet. Everybody that you got committed to vote for your bill, daylight savings tab, you check them off and get them committed to vote for mine when it hits the floor. Oh boy, he snatched the paper and took off. About two hours later, he came back with all the commitments. I had the roll call, I was checking as they voted. And that bill passed 27 to 3 with 8 abstentions. The 
NAACP, the black community, the black leadership, the black churches have a right to raise Christians just as the white community does. Um, what's your stand on the issues and what are you going to do to impact our communities? Uh, but there was a time that people felt like that, how dare you even question my vote uh, on an issue? And it was only when we started saying, well, you know, we don't have to vote for you. We can vote for someone else, people who are willing to be responsive to our concerns. We understood the power of the vote. We could march, we could boycott, but it still took the Board of Aldermen or the General Assembly to outlaw segregation. And as teenagers, since we turned 18, you went to register to vote. The Kentucky Civil Rights Act gave the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights the power to ensure that individuals and groups must comply with the law. We got two young men who were still in high school to uh, go to the, uh, uh, to the swimming pool. It was segregated. Uh, they were telling us that blacks could not swim there because it was built with private funds. We later found out it was on property owned by the school board. It was maintained by public funds, or by the, the city itself. Um, and so we filed a complaint. The State Commission on Human Rights held its first hearing in Campbellsville, Kentucky, to integrate the swimming pool there. The second hearing took place in my little hometown in Franklin, Kentucky. As a result of that, the commission held its second hearing and ordered the integration of the, pool, of the swimming pool. After 1967, the civil rights movement in Kentucky and nationwide changed. Young blacks, disillusioned that the movement had brought few real changes in their lives, turned to new strategies like Black is Beautiful and Black Power. In 1968, Two months after the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a rally to protest police mistreatment of a black businessman erupted into four days of sporadic rioting in the West End of Louisville. People were enraged and uh, there was a crowd at 28th and uh, Greenwood Avenue, 28th Street and Greenwood Avenue in Western Louisville. And people were murmuring because Stokely Carmichael was supposed to be coming and uh, rumor was that they wouldn't let the plane land with them and uh, uh, there were some young Turks and they were really drumming up the crowd about how awful this was and people began to move and I looked up and police cars were coming in from all directions and then all of a sudden it just was the spark. And I got on the phone and I called the paper and I said, what I will do is I will call in and describe to you what's happening down here. I'd call in and I'd say, you know, there's a lot going on on the corner now. People are dashing. Adults are moving out of the way. Young people have taken over the streets. I can smell the pungent smell of burning tires from the car that is turned over on flames. Uh, in the background, I can hear the sirens, and there's a buzz because people are talking and screaming and yelling. I said, I can also see the drifting tear gas that's coming this way. Stop. I've got to go. I'll call you somewhere else and tell you. Wait. They just broke into the pawn shop. Three people are coming out, and here's what they're carrying. Most folks knew that the Courier Journal didn't have any black reporters. And so a best example of how inconvenient that was, was I was standing in a, on a street corner, calling in, telling the newspaper what was happening when the police kicked open the door and stuck a shotgun in and said, I said to move on. And I told him, I said, I'm an acting reporter from the Courier Journal and gave him a little piece of paper that the editor had written it on. Merv Albertson is an acting reporter and he looked and he says, there are no nigger reporters at the Courier Journal and threw it out in the gutter and took his gun and ushered me on out. Many Kentucky colleges had black student union chapters in the late 1960s. BSUs were part of a black student movement that identified with black nationalist ideas. We developed a proposal that 
in some ways was original and, and had other elements that were borrowed from, from what other people were doing in other parts of the country. But the proposal was our blueprint for how the university needed to be changed and how its relationship with the community needed to be redefined. So you've got a uh, provision for 200 scholarships. We wanted to create a vice presidential level position, uh, an office of black affairs, a pan-African studies department, a black part of the library, black folks on the board of trustees. So we broke off negotiations and then, uh, you know, held, really did two building takeovers on successive days. After we did the president's office the first day, that night, we had a long, drawn-out strategy session. And the plan was that, that some of the students in the high school BSU, some of the older folks and, and some of the community groups we worked with, all were going to converge on campus the next day and we were going to take over the whole student center. And we had the chains and the paraphernalia that we needed to secure the building and we had an idea where everybody's going to be stationed and who was going to do what. Well, the next morning came and most of those folks didn't show. People got picked up on bench warrants and all that. And we always felt that somebody in that room the night before wasn't informed. So we had to change our plan uh, in fairly short order. And the reason why we chose the Dean's building was that it was smaller and we felt that with the number of people we had, we could secure it. Uh, it had no special significance beyond that. Uh, it was just something we felt would be manageable. We were as prepared as we could be. I mean, we knew that if we'd taken arms in there, you know, somebody's gonna get killed. But the, uh, you know, we, we wanted at that point to use those particular tactics. In any case, though, when the police finally got there, they, was, they were standing outside. There were about two or 300 angry white kids out around this building and they were you know they were out for blood you know like I said there's about 15 to 20 of us inside and then something fascinating happened uh, a lot of the black fellows on the football team and the basketball team actually formed like a protective line between those white kids and those of us who were in the building now these fellows would never come to a BSU meeting they thought we were crazy you know these are these little wild black folks out here but, you know, what they saw under those circumstances, you know, made them take a stand as well. So the police eventually break in and some of the folks walked out. You know, the rest of us refused to walk out, so they had to carry us out. Uh, this, this is the same time you've got the emergence of the Black Power Movement, the Panther Party, other groups like that on a national basis, King's Assassination. You know, all those things kind of blend in together. And I think it's important to keep that focus because we saw ourselves very much as being part of this national movement. What if we finally realized the infinite power of our collective wisdom married to action and simply walked out onto space, passing through all the barriers that we let hold us back, held hands and thought, this is our earth. Let us save it for the children. I don't think that, that things that, the way things were a long time ago need to always constantly be brought up. This is not what I'm saying because there have been some changes. But I think you need to be aware of what some of those things were so that if they began to creep in, you will be able to say, hey, wait a minute. This isn't the direction we want to go in. Uh, we must not let this happen, happen to us. The reason that we've had some progress in terms of race relations is that we've had uh, multiple approaches. You, know, you need to have, the, you need to have the, 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 the negotiators and you need to have the agitators. And, and, and they both need to work together. I mean, and, and, and then you have to have the litigators. <laughs> I became a teacher. I've been teaching for quite a while. Um, I teach in New Jersey now. And I work with a student population that is very diverse. And we emphasize programs for the children to understand the differences that they may have. I wish that cop 
would know, who stuck the gun in my stomach, would know that I'm now on the mass tattered paper and was the first African American there. But I wish he'd also know that as a result of my being there, I've been able to open doors for others to come, and that the executive editor of that paper looks like me, not him. Yes, today we can go, we can move, and we can live any place. But we still have discrimination on our jobs. There's still a need for the EEOC commission. So civil rights in itself has changed. But civil rights was not just about public accommodations either. As W.B. Du Bois said, it was about the improvement of the race. I've heard people say, well, one person can't make a difference. That isn't true. I wasn't but one. But I spoke up. And I said, but what about those who are behind me or with me? You know, What about my people? Mm -hmm. When I get tired, and when I think this battle may not have any end, I think of people who came before me. I think about my grandfather, who was born a slave, and who became an educator, became a lawyer, uh, became a prominent figure in Kentucky. Uh, and I think to myself, gee, if he did that, if he could walk 50 miles pulling a steer to pay his college tuition, who am I to complain? So if he did it, I surely can do it. If they 